Right, we'll get started. Um, welcome to the special seminar this morning. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Mohammed Al Hosseini. Um, Mohammed got his PhD from Rutgers in 2016 and um, has been uh, working at uh, Facebook and now at Baidu Research. Um, he will soon join the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, uh, KAUST, yep. uh, as an assistant professor in computer science in the computer vision group. And um, I think the topic of his talk is very exciting to use creativity to analyze images and what can we do uh, that is uh, innovative in computer vision. So imagination inspired vision. Thank you for visiting us. We're looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I'm excited to be here and that, that uh, all of you are here. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, um, a topic that I, I feel passionate and excited about. We might call it uh, imagination inspired uh, vision. But before I start, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of great people that I, I had the pleasure to collaborate with them. And a lot of work I mentioned here, they, uh, they were part of. Um, so uh, imagination is a key element of human intelligence that enables the humanity to progress at an ever faster rate. It helps us to create art, like these amazing pictures, uh, and also music. But not only that, it also helps us to understand the visual world. Um, let me start by this question. How many of you does know what Parakeet Oakley is? Perhaps not too many, but what if I tell you that Brachit Okut is a small bird that has a short orange beak and the bird plumage is dark above and white below. Are you now able to imagine it? Can you identify the relevant bird among these different ones? Probably. So this uh, example actually motivates that shows that we learn from uh, text descriptions by possibly that we imagine how does this look like in our head, it's mostly in different ways. And possibly we can uh, develop or, or teach machines that learn like us. Uh, my research focuses on uh, imagination inspired techniques to enable machines to see better from, from unseen classes like the one you just, uh, just mentioned, like Baraki Roklut, and also create novel uh, products by passion or art. So I will start by the seeing uh, section, and but let's start by the motivation. Why should we care about developed machi machines that imagine to to see? It is estimated that there exist more than 10,000 bird species in our planet, and the largest available collection of data that we we have access to as researchers could be only a few hundreds. This means that there are thousands of these species we don't have access to it, and if we or well, the best we hope for maybe uh, one example for for these classes. So this motivates uh, a lot of researchers to uh, uh, to um, develop models for zero-shot uh, visual recognition. And what this means is, that is we want to generalize to unseen labels. Uh, so during training, we have seen classes, like in, in this bird uh, um, a problem, bird classification problem, we might get exposed during training to a black photo albatross, a crystal booklet, American crow. And at this time, we have unseen classes like Brachidoclid or fish crow. But in order to facilitate this to happen, we need to describe this uh, unseen uh, bird species somehow. And the way this is done by, is by providing some side information that describe these classes, these new classes somehow. Um, historically speaking, people have adopted attribute-based models. And, and this is actually the way how these unseen classes or, see, or either seen classes or unseen classes are described to enable that transfer from, from seen to unseen. And you, as you may see in the right, it's, it's kind of a table where you can describe every class by some attributes, like let's say the wing color is, is white and black, uh, the head pattern is, is, is cab, and, uh, et cetera, the back color is white and black, et cetera. Um, so, and there's a long uh, list of related work in the, in the literature that tries to, 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 to develop uh, this work. And it, it, it was mainly pioneered by uh, Christopher Lampert et al. and Prahari et al. and a lot of other work that follows up on that. Um, but there's some drawbacks of, of this uh, notion uh, of attributes because it deals with the dilemma of finding the best set of attributes. So how do we define this uh, entries of this table? It becomes a, ch a challenge. Another thing is that we need to manually annotate this 
and the, the, we have typically hundreds of these attributes. So we, this means that we need to annotate whether each of these attributes exists or not for every single class. And that sometimes as these annotations might need to be collected at a, every single image, which could be expensive. So in 2013, uh, that was about six years ago, I and colleagues, uh, my, my advisor, uh, Professor Olga Mala Trudgers, developed a, 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 an approach that enabled zero shot classification from language descriptions that may come from Wikipedia, let's say. So in this case, you will have, uh, it will be easy to access this inf information because you can just look up the name of the bird and come up with easily with this Wikipedia page. And we don't have to deal with the dilemma of defining the set of attributes. Um, but it deals with a challenge on the other hand that this text could be noisy and might have irrelevant textual information that right? maybe um, text that bottom text would be talking that this bird um, Immigrate from this sea in, in, in the summer, from this place to this place, which could be irrelevant to describing the, or the appearance of this of this uh, visual category. So, so let's start by uh, by uh, introducing some notations to formalize the problem. We uh, let's assume that we have a linear classifier for class K, if K of X equals C K transpose X. Uh, where CK here is a linear classifier, you can think of it as a vector that is applied on top of a feature vector X and made it by, by one. And uh, the way we do standard multi-class classification setting is that if we have a learned function for every class uh, we, and, and we have an image X that we want to classify, we apply this function for every class on top of the image and we, we classify the image X to the class that have the highest confidence. This is a standard, a standard classification task. What is different here is that we want to um, build a classifier for an unseen text description. So we want to build a function phi that takes as an input a language description of an unseen class and synthesize that classifier, comes up with this C that would, we then execute on an image. So that's, that's the hope. Uh, we want to synthesize this in the fly because we don't have the data for, for, for that at this time. We have only one language description, we don't have uh, images. And this, in, in this setting, the language descriptions comes at the category level, not at the image level. So that this means that this text description is map is expected to predict a classifier for, let's say if this text description is the examples that we mentioned earlier about Parakeet Oakland, that would be the description of it and what we expect of it, of it to predict a, a, a linear, uh, let's say, a, a linear, in this case for simplicity, a linear classifier that we can execute an, an image and tell us how probable this image to be belonging to the to to the text description that we have here about the parakeet oak. Um, so uh, so basically, how do we do that? Back in 2013, was uh, let's say that uh, in 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 the uh, we have uh, access to a set of text description of seen classes, as you may see here. So at training time, we have a text descriptions and a set of Images for every for every scene class, like this. And the way we we, we use uh, this uh, during the training, and let's say that we have a text description T1 till Tn for the scene classes and the corresponding images, and we can uh, we we train uh, we try to relate this to to domains, the visual and the language domain, by learning a, a, a transformation matrix W that predicts the the classifier in the visual space from the uh, text description. Uh, so we, we formulate this as a constraint optimization task that relates a text T I to an image X J. So if the text if the text uh, and the image uh, X, X J belong to the same class, we encourage this interpolation to be to be high. Uh, and if the text and the image does not belong to the same class, so let's say the text description of of Pupu Link and images of cardinals. So you want this uh, correlation to be low, which is the second set of constraints. So if it's a positive bear, then, then we seek high correlation. If it's a negative bear, then we seek low correlation. Um, so, but we have, that, that was a model that we developed back in 2013. We haven't talked about the notion of imagination that we, we, talk, we started with in, 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 the, in the beginning of this talk. Uh, this actually motivated us to, to develop a technique. Moving fast forward to 2000, 2018, we developed a technique that actually explicitly modeled this notion that happens to be performing much better uh, based on that inspiration. So the key idea is to start from a language description of the class that we 
we want to learn about, um, let's say, this papyroclet, and we have a generator, which we, we might call the imaginer in this, in this context, that is hopefully uh, synthesizes a different uh, images or visual representation of that, that matches that language description that we have in here. What, the, what, the, what, what would be the advantage of this is that we, we may convert the zero-shot classification task into a, 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 a standard supervised uh, classification setting. How, that, how this is possible is that we, for unseen classification, uh, for unseen class classification, the problem is that we don't have the data. But now, given that we have an access uh, to a generation that hopefully does its job, uh, we can generate this data. It will be a fake data that, that, that are generated from the given description. So the input is a, a text description and the output is visual representation. How does it look like in the visual space? And then we may imagine that this can apply, for example, referring to this example of 10,000 bird species that we have in our planet, we may uh, I have, an, I have a way to, to generate um, examples for each of these. Uh, and if it's hopefully generalized, it's, this would help us learn more, more, more and more about these unseen uh, species. Um, so uh, the key idea of the approach is based on a dominant generative model uh, uh, called Generative Adversarial Network, proposed by Ian Goodfellow and colleagues in 2014. Um, and the idea is as uh, follows. So the, uh, we have the text description of uh, that unseen bird concatenated with uh, a random vector, a uh, vector of random numbers that represent the variations within this class. So every, ran every different random number, given the same text description expected to, to for example, produce me a different instance uh, that respects its language description. So these two together uh, undergoes a series of operations that we call the generator, imagine in our case, that produces finally an image or let's say a visual representation for, for, for that respect this text description. Um, and then this uh, image is then fed to uh, another network, which we call the discriminator, that is trained to produce fake if the input comes from the generator, and, and is trained to produce real if the input comes from the training data. Uh, uh, these two networks, the, 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 the uh, uh, discriminator and, and generator, are trained simultaneously, and the generator, which is the pink section in this, uh, in this uh, picture, uh, update is a parameter so that the uh, generated image looks more and more like a like a bird, and also to trick the discriminator to believe that the produced generations looks more and more like like a like a real like 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 a bird. Um, and this actually was proposed by uh, Odena Ika. This approach was proposed by Odena in 2017, which is the approach that we start with as a such a conditional GAN approach that can actually facilitate this kind of way of modeling. But when we applied that, it didn't actually work. It, it produces, uh, this is uh, what you see on, on the left is, uh, is the ground truth. And this is the produced generation if you use the Adena et approach. So the generations lacks the sufficient discrimination to, to enable zero uh, shot planning, or zero shot recognition to happen more effectively. So when we produce generations, it overlaps a lot and it becomes difficult to. So we had to do something to make this work better. Uh, what we did is that we added a regularizer we call visual pivot regularizer uh, that helps us to go from the picture on the right to the picture on the left, which brings makes these uh, 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 classes well separate from each other and more compact. Um, and this happens by by this regularizer. And what does this do is that it added it it, it tries to um, go over every single class we used to in training. Let's say we have um, 150 classes, we use 100 classes for training. So it go, this summation is a summation over these 100 classes. And it computes the, expected, the expectation of the, of the uh, images for, for the expected features for the images, for the real images for that class. It's a training class, we have access to the data, so we can generate the, the we can produce representation with, with, the, with the network, and we can compute the expected features. We can do that as well for for the for the fake data. We can feed the text description of that unseen class of that just that class and have some produced uh, fake data from given its text description. And what we try to do is that we will try to get these two the two to be close to each other more explicitly, which is a which happens to be a good learning signal to help us move from the picture on the on the on the right to the picture on the left, as you may see. Um, 
So uh, looking more from the architecture details perspective, this is how the, uh, the generator looks like. Uh, that takes a, as an input, the top part is a, a basically the generator that takes as an input the, the language uh, description and the, the, the noise vector, but notice that there's some change that we added on, on top of the language description. So typically in, in conditional GAN models, people concatenate the Z vector, which represent the, represents the variation directly with the conditioning signal. So instead here, we added another layer uh, on top of the text description. And the purpose of this is to suppress the noise. This is more needed here in the setting because the language description could be noisy. So this gives the model some uh, opportunity to suppress the language terms that could be irrelevant, like uh, non-visual non text. And when we analyze actually the push, we found that the, the connections that are related to the terms that are non-visual have a, a smaller L2 norm, meaning that it does contribute the least into the prediction of these generations condition on the text description. And then like, the visual terms like peak or orange will contribute more to generations. Um, so, uh, uh, how do we evaluate that? We uh, we evaluated that on multiple data sets, but here, for example, we, uh, for instance, we uh, use a COP data set just for the sake of, of the time. I will cover just one, but the same thing applies for other data sets as well. Uh, so, the COP data sets have 200 bird species of 11,000 images. We divided that into 150 categories for training and 50 uh, the remaining 50 are used for testing. Um, here, this is some Appalachian studies that shows how the GAN approach uh, works if we use as is, which is a baseline. This is the Odana et al. ICML 17 approach. Uh, the uh, second row is basically the visual pivot regularizer, which is additional loss only without the adversarial component. And uh, the last, last row is basically our approach, which you can think of it as a combination of these two signals together. Um, so you can see that every individual component does not perform really well, but if you add these two together, you get the best of, you get the significantly better results. So the, each one of them is significantly lower than state of the art, but the adding them together uh, is actually several percent better than the state of the art. Um, the second row here on the cup balance, it shows the value of the uh, additional layer, noise suppression layer that you add on top of text. So we want us to see if that additional layer we added has has some value. So we, we did an experiment without this noise suppression layer, and the performance dropped by 3% from 43 to 40%, and also on other, uh, and other components of the model as well, similarly. Um, we applied this also on, on, on the NA bird data set, which, which is a bigger one of, um, of about 500 species. And we had the, the observation is actually very similar. Um, in contrast to the state of the art, this is how it looks like. So this is the uh, uh, state of the art me method. Most of them does not use this adversarial notion. It tries to uh, model the connection of, it, it, it treats it as a, as a multimodal problem and they want to learn a common space of vision and language, but does not have this variational uh, notion that is introduced by the Z vector when you concentrate those with a text description. And this shows that that um, actually modeling the notion of imagination is helpful for understanding scene classes and to, deal, to better deal, and also deals better with, with noise. Um, just to summarize, this is this is this kind of, this problem of recognizing uh, unseen species from language description is a problem that I have cared about for years, uh, starting 2013 and I have, have tried to develop better methods over, over the years. So the linear approach, for example, that started I started with in 2013, the performance was 26%. When you add nonlinearity, the performance jumped to 33%. When you model the path motion, mean that when you let's say uh, say the orange beak part, you want to connect the orange beak to the head part of the bird versus the tail part of the bird. So when you add this notion more explicitly, the the performance jumps to 37%. And finally, when you in, when you try to model the uh, imagination, uh, modeling the, 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 the visual, uh, uh, explicitly the, the notion of image measure, you get a, an additional gain from 37 to 43% on, 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 on the cop data set. One question, and the percentages, what do they mean exactly, precision? 
uh, the, uh, the, yeah, this per percentage is the unseen classification performance. So let's say we have um, 50 unseen classes. For each one of these, we have language description. We use the generator to generate uh, data, for, fake data for each one of these classes. Mm -hmm. So we have now the fake data for, for the unseen classes, and then we have a test example. We do nearest neighbor classification on the fake data. And that's the classification performance you put it here. Any question? Yeah. Nineteen. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, extra layer that you added is on top of the. Uh, yeah. Just a standard default layer or. Fully connected layer, standard fully connected layer. It's a, it's a good, this is a good question, but I, um, it, the attention mechanism means that we want to look at um, the, the network, it's the, the um, text description itself will self-predict which terms are important. Uh, in, in the context of, of of where the data is less needed, I, I, I haven't tried that, but I, 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 I it, it's worth trying, but my expectation is that this would work better when you have data, data uh, abundance of data. Because in this case, imagine that you have 100 bird species. So you have only 100 articles, because the text description comes at only the category level. So attention mechanism might 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 not have sufficient data to learn something meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> so uh, uh, I here I want to reflect how this could relate to maybe our everyday life. Um, maybe in in some situations we uh, we encounter a bird and out of nowhere it, it flies away. And in other situations, we actually have to fly away. Otherwise, we could be a meal for this hungry pair. In, in both situations, from biodiversity perspective, we care about both the bird and the pair and identifying them at the fine grained level because we, we want to know if this species is in danger or not. We might not remember, uh, we might not know as, as non experts the name of the bird or the name of the bird. Uh, or in in in, in a fine grain at the fine grain level, but we might have we might remember how does it look like, and we can describe that I saw a bird that have an orange beak and the plumage is dark above and white below, and that description might be sufficient for AI to to learn to identify that. So we might have this um, kid who were playing with with the bird and and uh, he have he are interact now interacting with this. Uh, probe who loves the environment, and he might ask, I just saw a bird that has an orange beak, what is it? And then maybe this question, this information is not enough to identify it at the final level, so we might interact it. Uh, this this uh, robot might ask more and more questions until we reach um, an answer that we are happy with. So now the, the kid is able to learn and receive more information about the bird that's, that's flight away without knowing what it is about. So this actually motivates that geostrat planning could help, for example, collecting data for, for a lot of species and providing this as, a, as a information. That it has some promise to, to go in, to, to provide this data uh, and make it more accessible for many people, because many people, more people will be able to describe that unidentified species. Maybe this information might help decision makers to do something about the species in danger. Uh, so, uh, so the, uh, the, the this perspective, I uh, they have a vision that I will invite to the, the United Nations uh, Convention of Biodiversity to cover exactly this particular aspects. And a lot of people actually are are excited about the role of AI that that might play might be playing in in protecting species and things like that. Hi everyone. <coughs> so I did it to 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 uh, just uh, further this this work is uh, is done while while I'm at Facebook. Um, so now I'm 
trying to target another perspective. So how do you use the, the notion of imagination to actually imagine to, to create new things like, like art and fashion and things like that, uh, which happens to be actually very related. You can think of zero planning is about understanding the unseen. Creativity is about creating the unseen. So it's very late. If you can, you can relate them by how do you think about them. Um, so uh, the, 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 the work I would start is, uh, with is creative, uh, is a paper creative uh, uh, that we call Creative Adversarial Networks. It's a paper that we proposed a couple of years ago that builds on top of, of Gantt. And the key idea is actually to learn how to reproduce uh, um, new generations that have never been seen before. This hopefully uh, people uh, may like. To start with uh, images like Tide in the Sun's abstract art give this, and the aim is to generate some uh, new images uh, that, that are different. It's not it's not new styles, but totally different content. Um, so the the in, the inspirations comes comes from the principle of least effort, uh, which can be visualized by this wonder curve. It, it's a by a Canadian psychologist called. Colin Martin that, and what this picture is saying is that let's say the x-axis is novelty of a piece of art, let's say, and the y-axis is, is uh, likability, which you might call the hedonic value. So, and what this is saying is that the, if novelty is low, people not, might not like the work, like likability is the, is the y-axis. And as novelty increases, people will start to like the work more and more but not for too long. After some point when the work is too novel to understand and to relate what you have seen before, uh, it will become more difficult to appreciate. It becomes harder. And, and this, this shows actually this, this, this kind of behavior. Um, it will fall uh, uh, after that into this negative hedonic range. So that's the, that's the key idea. So we want to use something novel, but not too novel, because, because sometimes, sometimes, I don't know, when you say, let's say, submit papers to conference, if if it's not novel, people might not like it. If it's if it's hard to relate to the literature, people will like it. If it's easy to relate to the literature but have some novelty, people will like it. But if it's too novel to relate to any of the existing work, people will start to less appreciate the work. Um, so uh, the work is still based on GANs, generative adversarial networks. Uh, but let's say if we train a GAN model. Uh, based on the art data, um, we might end up with a model that generates the, the Mona Lisa again, which is a scene example. But if it does that, it's, it's good, it's a good picture, but it doesn't push the limits of the model to generate something new. So we want to, what we want to do is to add an additional learning signal that helps the generator models to go beyond the data or encourage it somehow to, to go beyond the data. So let's say that we start with the uh, set of art movement or art styles that includes abstract art, cubism, impressionism, hardness, etc. Let's say that we have access to these labels. What we did is, is we added an additional classific style classification loss so that during training when we have this picture of Mona Lisa, so we not only predict that it's real, we also predict which style it belongs to. So for the Mona Lisa, it would be high renaissance. And we do that for all the, all the, um, the data that comes from the data set. But when we train the generator, we, we train it such that it, it, is, it produces generations that are classified as real, but at the same time, with this additional classification head, we try to encourage it to be difficult to classify. So given the, an image that is generated by, by this um, uh, generator, we encourage it to be, say, I don't know which class it belongs to. And the way we, we quantify that is by entropy. So we encourage the, this, the conditional distribution, the, the distribution, the probability of style given uh, the generated image from the generator to be high entropy over, over a style loop. So you don't know which style label it belongs to. Does, does that make sense? And, and, and this is basically, this circle shows the uh, uh, loss that encourages this, devi this deviation to happen. Um, so for example, if we feed the picture of the Mona Lisa, 
it will be hope if this is generated by the generator the uh, this the discriminator will classify it with 100 percent as a renaissance right but this will give a, a, a low creativity score and the, so this means that will give the uh, si signal to the this generator not to do that we can analyze it to, to do to produce things that has been seen before that have a low entropy over the style that we carry, that we have access to. Um, uh, on the other hand, when we produce a picture that is hard to classify, let's say the, we have four four scene styles. If we generate something that deviates pretty much from all of them, then this will give a high creativity score, and then this uh, the, our network will give the thumbs up to 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 this generation. So it promotes somehow to to learn to deviate in, in from from the scene um, from the scene style. How does this relate to the principle of the stiffer that we talked about a few slides ago? Um, the the way this is can be interpreted is we encourage the model to be more like a combination of existing styles versus totally new ones. So we didn't add an additional load node to encourage the genetics to be totally different from all the styles that we have seen before. So since since the, the condition distribution over styles is expected to be high entropy, this means that it should not belong to any of the existing styles. But since since it's a combination, is it's, it's still easier to relate to what we have seen, and hence it's not expected to be too far in terms of, of, of novelty versus adding an additional node to that encourages this, this generation to be to be totally different from from all the styles that we have, have seen so i mean let's say if you have k styles i can add to the classification uh, to the classifier an additional node k plus one for the novel classes we tried that but this, this didn't work as good as the the one that is that, that is more uh, related to the entropy so these are some of the generations that has been produced by, by our work, um, some qualitative uh, examples. Uh, that, that, uh, and um, here, here are some basically uh, human subject experiments that is uh, where we, we do the Turing test on, on the generations uh, from, from GAN, from Art, Bezel. So GAN is a, is a baseline, CAN is our approach. So this means that uh, can uh, uh, is more likely to pass the Turing test than GAN by about 10%, uh, but it's less than, let's say, some, uh, some classic art like abstract expressionism. It's easier for people to tell that this is this is produced by human, the classic art. But if you do the same thing for art puzzle, which is a, is also is also human generated art, but it's very recent and it's abstract, so it's easy for people to 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 think that this art is produced by also machine. In fact, some of the recent art actually was produced by, by, by artists writing algorithms to produce pieces of art. Um, so these are also some uh, studies that we did uh, on the dimensions of like intentionality, structures, communication, and inspiration. These are, these are dimensions that people uh, in the art literature, literature has, has used to, to evaluate human art. So we use the same principles to, to see how does this relate to also real art and the the, the the scores with respect to others was sometimes better and, and or competitive. Um, so Ken has a, has has gained some some interest in in for example the scientific community um, and and also the uh, <coughs> has been invited for example to art exhibitions like the Frank Frankfurt Book Fair which is which is one of the largest in the world and uh, Los Angeles art exhibition here. Um, um, make sure that we put our code out there. The problems that we're trying to solve are the sorts of problems that no individual is going to solve on their own, and probably no one organization is going to solve. This is just uh, some, uh, it was featured as part of the official fair video, and um, I you know, like it. The... It's really cool. So, who painted it? A machine. It's actually the first work of art made by AI to be sold at Sotheby's. Sorry, I'm late, Dana, I got a call. Okay. It's also covered by the uh, TV series of Silicon Valley. So this, this piece of generations were, was generated by, by Ken. Um, so we, we also worked on 
extending this later on. We will be extending this in the context of fashion. Fashion has some promise that it, 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 it's something that impacts our everyday life. Um, and it also uh, a, a possibility or, or, or an opportunity to learn how creativity may impact multiple dimensions, not only not only the texture, but also the shape. So creativity may take place here, here in multiple dimensions. So I, I, I will probably go quickly over that because the notion is, is similar, uh, but it's basically want to generate something that may relate to companies' DNAs and things like that, and, and hopefully something that people will, will like. Um, the idea is similar, but we have two additional hats, one for shape level creativity and texture level creativity. And we also expose different loss functions, like we in, in the CAN approach, we, we, uh, we investigated that binary cross entropy loss uh, as an as a, as a, as a, as a entropy loss, but here we try things like Sharma metal entropy, uh, uh, multi-class cross entropy loss, uh, Celis and, and Renit. So we tried different divergence measures to, to, to model the notion of entropy. entropy. Um, so that's what the scope of exploring this, uh, this more, relatively more recent project. Um, and yeah, so what I what I want to show here is that we can actually reproduce the uh, the one dot curve that we talked about earlier. How do we do that? For every model, we can have a bunch of generations, and we can compute the average nearest neighbor from from the training data for every single example. And that could be a quantification of how novel the, the generation of this model from, from the training year. So we can plot each model as a point here. And novelty is based on human judgment. We ask people, how much do you like, let's say, for each, uh, how, how much like do, you, do you like each of these generations? <coughs> I want to mention that one of the key challenges in this particular project is that we used a relatively small uh, skill assets that have only 4,000 4, images. But one, one may wonder why the standard GAN is here, is, is very novel for, for that. And it's, it's not likable. Uh, but and the reason why we're investigating that is that since the data is not in this setting, was not huge. The images had a lot, uh, uh, has produced a lot of artifacts. It's similar to the generation, the, the, the training data, but it has a lot of artifacts that make the nearest neighbor distance with respect to the data height. But these artifacts, in turn, are not likable in this plot. That's why it has a low uh, score. Uh, in, in other uh, plots, which has the our newer loss here that we tried, have some balance between the novelty and, and creativity. In fact, if you add to the standard again, an additional classification loss that uses the class labels, it pushes this from here to the right there. It will be very hard to because this additional learning signal will significantly reduce the artifacts, and hence the produced generation will be very similar to the to the training data. So the GAN is here, but GAN plus classification loss would be on the other side. So these are some examples that are produced, some interesting shapes. And you may see here, I would say this example could, could be seen as interesting. It, it's a pants with extended arm sleeves. The, the, the training data does not have that. It has pants and has t-shirts. And the model somehow learned to come up with something that, that makes them up. Yeah. So the, the work has... Uh, uh, received the best paper in ACCV workshop last year, and also um, I and colleagues presented at, at the um, at the F8 uh, Facebook conference, which is the high impact uh, any, mini annual uh, Facebook conference. Um, so, <clears throat> one thing I, I would like to uh, conclude with for, for this part is that creativity and ambiguity loss that we talked about in the context of creativity. Can actually loop back and help this exactly the same problem of zero shot recognition that we started with in the beginning of this talk. So how how does this relate? We remember this one dot curve in the context of creativity, but this also be made related to zero shot learning. Zero shot learning is about understanding unseen objects. 
uh, creativity is about creating a likable unseen. And thinking of this from the perspective of zero shot learning, if we have a generative zero shot learning model that, that, that produces. Are you okay to drive? Like, I hate this car. Yeah, it's stressful the whole time, right? Like, the pickup is so bad. Like, you're pushing. It's like, they're not meant to... So, if we, if we have, if we have, um, <laughs> a generative zero <laughs> planning <laughs> setting, that we just only... Matthew? Yeah. 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 Matthew? Hello? Matthew? Oh, also, we can hear everything they're talking. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's okay. So, if we have a generative zero shot learning setting that's trained on, on some scene data, but it learns only to generate scene classes, at test data we have unseen class. So, this might have a good, might not have a good generalized zero shot learning performance. It will be because it will, it will the the produced generations will lack sufficient discrimination against scene classes. So what I mean by that, let's say here you can see crested oaklet and barkeep oaklet are both very similar in terms of appearance. They have even the same similar orange peak, but the only difference is is in in this uh, curved feather that comes out of the crested oaklet example. So if we have a model that 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 does not understand these, these kind of subtle differences, it might produce generations that overlaps a lot with Barkito because with what it, this is what it has seen. So, so that this will not result on a good uh, uh, generalized performance, which is which is related to likability from the perspective of creativity. But if we have a better model that can generate uh, uh, Generations that deviate from the scene classes, then we expect the performance of, to be to be actually better. But we don't want that deviations to be to be too far to disable transfer from the scene classes because when we say when we say something like orange peak, we understood it from the scene classes and want to still transfer that to the unseen classes, but in a way that is discriminated. So we want to to deviate. That to, make, to make the generative zero shot learning setting to be uh, uh, to deviate from the same classes, but not too much to disable transform the same classes. This is how the, you can think of this relationship between creativity and, and understanding unseen objects. Um, so the way we do that is that we added an additional loss. So the, the, the bottom part here is exactly the same approach that I described earlier in the beginning of this talk. So what we add is an additional loss that that uh, tries to explore the unseen space of 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 uh, unseen space of of classes. So we have T here is a text description of a sync. And let's say that we assume that we have a tool that will produce a hallucinated text that explore the unseen space of uh, of text. We don't have access to the unseen text, but we let's say that we show that let's say that we have a, a process that produces hallucinated text that are in the hard negative space of of the scene class around it, but we're sure that this shouldn't be one of the scene class. If we assume that we have that hallucinated text that shouldn't be in the scene classes, we can feed this forward to the generator, as you see here. And the training, the signal that we define here is that these images should not belong to any of the scene classes. So what we encourage to do is that this should be produced, should be classified as real. So this should be uh, look like a bird images. And as, but at the same time, it will be should be hard to classify these generations to be among any of the scene classes. Uh, so how do we produce this hallucinated text? We did some uh, something simple. We we pick uh, text description T A and T B from the scene class, two random ones, and we we randomly interpolate between them uh, with an alpha between point two and point eight. And we with this alpha can 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 take any value for every single mini patch. So this is kind of how we explore the hard negative space of scene classes. And when, in, when we push this uh, inside in, in inside the network, 
we basically uh, uh, encourage to say that hey, hey, this is not some. It tells basically it tries to tell the generator, hey, this is not a sync class. You shouldn't consider this as a sync class. So you can think of this additional part. Since it does not use any labels, you can think of it as a regularizer. But it's it's a regularizer that is motivated by exploring that dark space of unseen classes uh, somehow. And and you can see that the difference here between the the blue and the blue. A blue and red curve is is the the red uh, curve is basically the approach that we presented from CVPR last year, CVPR 18, that we presented at the beginning of this talk. The the blue line is is the same thing, but we added this loss. So you can see it made a big difference uh, in terms of the generalized visual learning performance. And this is also in another digital retrieval. You can see that the performance also uh, have improved from let's say 40 to 46 percent. From 31 to 34 um, percent. Uh, so this is just some slight thing. This is a work that um, I, I um, also did that appeared this year. I see it last week. So we presented this last last week. Uh, I found the generative models are helpful for understanding and generation. So I tried to care about how to make them better. So this is this is uh, this is a GAN model. And if we have, uh, um, uh, GANs typically suffer from mode collapse. So this, this means that if we have this set of modes, it might learn to remember only one of them and read only from that one. But uh, the, the, what we wanted to do here is to, alle to alleviate this mode collapse problem by, by adding an additional le learning signal that distributes. So if you have, let's say, pictures of, of let's say, uh, men and women, and this is the training data, we don't want a model to generate only men or only women. We want it Generate both. So we want the models to be fair across all the modes of data that we. So we have uh, proposed this uh, approach. It, it is basically an integration of the determinant point processes and GAN. DBP is a, a, an elegant probabilistic model that is used typically to do, for example, video summarization. So uh, video summarization is let's say that you have uh, 1,000 frames or 100 frames, and you want to select the only 10, 10, 10 frames of this. So do you want to basically select these 10 frames that, such that they are as diverse as possible? You don't want to uh, to pick repeated frames. Uh, this, the notion what you use here is that we get inspiration from this to encourage diversity in generative models. So you want to pick the to, to encourage the generator G to behave more like a determinant point sampler, so that it have in mind uh, it is gets gets promoted at the min, as as it generates every mini patch. That if this mini patch is diverse, it gets a reward. If it's not diverse, it it penalizes it. And when we add that loss, it it improves the performance significantly and also has learning efficiency uh, advantage. So it learns to cover cover this 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 is basically the uh, uh, quality, and this is the the number of moves. So what I mean by that is that this. Um, uh, this WGAN GP model is covering all the modes, but not of a good quality. So here, this this mod this model is showing that it we cover the uh, the uh, the the modes uh, at, at uh, and the, at a higher quality in the least number of iterations. This this is what this is trying to tell. Um, yeah. So in in conclusion, I I do work on. Combine on, on how do we learn um, to how how do we learn about the uns, uh, understand unseen classes or least seen classes uh, in the context of understanding and also generations. I also sometimes care about uh, about it from the perspective of lifelong learning setting. So as we we might see earlier, a dog and a tiger jumping uh, and a dog running, and maybe at this time later on on time. Uh, we have we might encounter a liger jumping. I haven't seen a liger, but I have seen a tiger and a lion. I haven't seen liger jumping, but I have seen earlier dog running. So I might learn this composition and modeling that as a time dimension is something that is lifelong learn. So if I have seen cats and dogs yesterday, and today I'm learning about birds and flowers, I do want to learn about birds and flowers without forgetting cats and dogs that I learned yesterday. So this is something I also care about, and uh, yeah. This is just a summary of I, I worked on semantic guides, visual recognition, creativity. Um, and so this is this is basically the an overview of the, the research that I 
uh, uh, mission that I, 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 I hope to do. Uh, efficient learning for visual understanding and generation. From visual understanding perspective, I hear about problems like zero shot learning, um, use language guidance, singly apart training, continual learning. From visual generation, creativity in art and fashion, creativity in 3D, how do you use language to guide that, uh, uh, that creativity? Um, and thank you. Yeah. Um, can these models be used to defeat CAPTCHA? To, to, to do what? Defeat, defeat CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA. Cap, CAPTCHA, I don't know what words. Cap, ah, cap, oh, I see. Uh, to, to deceit, okay. Uh, it's a good question. I haven't uh, haven't thought about that. For example, if you, if you have sufficient training, example, to identify a particular character, so from an image, maybe you can extract all the characters and be great data. Yeah, I I I I I I think that will be. I want to use it if if we have <laughs> if we if we cannot do that because I don't uh, like. To <laughs> uh, I um, if we so we we want to basically uh, tr train a model. For, you are talking about basically the understanding part because in capture you are giving a picture that you, and you want to. So maybe the model. This model kind of model can be you can hallucinate these different variations, uh, and and this will make it likely for the model to do well on on on, on recognizing this character. I think that's that's a possibility. I haven't I haven't thought about that, but it's worth I would say it's worth investigating. But one angle that I sometimes think about is is related to self-driving cars. Let's say uh, maybe you can uh, we want to produce or uh, uh, maybe scenes that may, may likely to produce a dangerous situation and by training on this hallucination that may, the model may come up with this might might lead to safer driving cars things like that but, yeah yeah so um, you said you evaluated the, the art creator or generator with humans and they, they assessed that the, the, um, the created pieces were like like but um, did the system also generate the titles or the captions for the pictures? N not yet, but this is something I, I, I'm I trying to investigate these days. But this is this is a very interesting topic. Um, uh, I want to do something in this space so we can discuss more about that. Uh, yeah. So this is very interesting because it's like the things I wonder is if you have thought about maybe using work that identifies features in images so that identifies you know the background is the sky and therefore this bird is yeah so just to be able to add features to your original annotated set. yeah so that might help you identify new classes or identify ways to combine features in novel ways yeah, I, I think this is a very interesting thing, and it opens a uh, whole new world uh, of maybe enabling, um, hopefully, localized changes in the image that, that may make, that, that I, am, I sometimes might not want to change the entire image. I might produce something, and I want to change some, something that's very local, and maybe some, the machine can help me with some inspiration or something like that. And I think, I think uh, working on this, uh, uh, I want to work on this. Uh, homework, I would say. <laughs> it's a, a beautiful AI home, homework that I will be exciting to, 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 to explore and see if we, what, what AI may enable in this scope. Um, I think this might, might, might increase the possibility of making this technology be a useful tool for, for artists, designers, and, and things like that. And, 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 um, and pe make people, I'd say, let's say, are art, artists, designers, less be more, be more embracing for this stuff. Because I, 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 some of the feedback I sometimes hear that people uh, in the art community think that hey, machines are going to replace us and things like that. But I, I kind of feel that we, we may think of it differently because at, at some point, art in the in the in, in the classic time was mainly was mainly based on visualizing the reality 
before photography was invented. And then after photography was intended, people started to think about new modes of expressions, and this made, made, made led to invention of new art movements like cubism and, and things like that. So I kind of feel that maybe this this can be thought as a way that may accelerate or amplify the, uh, the 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 rate of producing creative content rather than than rather than something that we we could be scared of. Um, so uh, one of the problem steps facing Jim in Gantz, using Gantz in the text of me is that you have to produce structure or so you can't just perturb any part of the image and then uh, I mean it's not a continuous space, it's discrete words like as compared to in images. So uh, would you not face the same issue when you're designing uh, clothes? Or for example, the the ones that you've shown over there are um, are these images like when they're produced by the network? Yes. Which slide you mean? You mean pictures like pictures like the let's say the one on the bottom or yeah the fashion one the, the fashion one yeah let's say this this pants right so uh, I mean would they be really I mean the ones that the network learned to create would they be really bounded or actually usable because then you'll have to impose some properties like. Uh, you know, it should it should not like spill colors all over the. True, over the true, true. I, I haven't worked explicitly on that, but this seems to seems to be a very interesting angle. So for for uh, I don't know when I generate, I want to generate um, let's say a chair, three D chair. I want to generate it with with um, I don't know affordance in mind. So I want to generate a chair that I can sit on. So this fun the function of the thing that I want to generate something that I I want to, I want the model to think of. Um, I think this is interesting, and 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 we probably should do more work on on this space. I I haven't explicitly uh, modeled that here, but maybe maybe one 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 of the challenges do we have do we have data to encourage uh, this model to think more explicitly about this affordance? Maybe that was, was is one challenge. Um, and it, could we learn about this more in a self-supervised way or, or a semi-supervised way? This could be also good questions, but and forcing. I haven't thought about it, but it's a really good question. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. machine learning aspects and so on. So the back to image generation is very interesting and intriguing because human creativity is so powerful. 